and welcome to Mindset, an HCD vidcast, where we dive into the world of applied consumer neuroscience and market research with leading experts in the field. My name is Michelle Nigella, PhD in behavioral neuroscience and director of research and innovation at HCD. And I'm Catherine Ambrose, the manager of behavioral and marketing sciences with HCD. As your hosts, we are going to act as the buzzkills for the buzzwords, taking time to critically think about the limitations and pitfalls of emerging trends and topics within the field to help you identify what innovation has a lot of untapped potential or is too good to be true. Now, HCD is a full service research house which provides research capabilities on consumers by looking at how they perceive, evaluate, and respond to different types of stimuli, such as looking at product experiences, communications, or just general consumer and shopper experiences. We use a combination of tools that come from psychology, physiology, neuroscience, as well as the traditional methods that people typically use to see how they experience different stimuli. That stimuli can range from the early stages of exploration all the way through the final product validation tests. This is what we refer to as applied consumer neuroscience. So stick around for more curious conversations as we chat our way through the ever evolving space of consumer science. Hi, and welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're so excited here on the HCD Mindset series um, to have Jeanette Andrews with us. Uh, this is super exciting because we've been doing some work with her lately, and uh, we really want to talk about it because it's been super fun. Um, so without further ado, let's kind of launch right into this. Jeanette, welcome to our discussion. Um, we'd love if you could tell us a little, well, I guess, yeah, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself um, and what it is that you do. Yeah, of course. Um, so my name's Jeanette Andrews. Um, I'm a magician and artist and speaker um, based in New York City. And I a lot of my work really deals with kind of our sensory perception and how magic oftentimes can be a great tool to have conversations about how we understand the world around us through our senses and how sometimes there's either kind of loopholes within this sensory um, perception or somehow our expectations are kind of violated or distorted um, in some way um, and how we can just, you know, further have conversations and understanding of the world around us. It's yeah. so interesting because, um, you know, it, it might sound strange at first to like, you know, we're talking about magic on this show that we talk about science, but I think that, you know, illusions and science and magicians, it really goes together really well, you know, specifically with what you're saying about sensory, because it's definitely what we always talk about when we talk about sensory and consumer products, because the things that you sense around you is really how you interpret the world and how you're supposed to navigate and interact with it. And so there's just tons of science there for you. Now we, I met you, um, through, uh, our mutual friend, uh, Mindy Yang with perfumery. She had recommended you and we brought you in for the Pangborn meeting, which was super cool to have you, you know, demonstrate to everybody, some of these ideas. Um, how did you get into this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, I got into magic when I was four years old. Um, I saw a Siegfried and Roy TV special and I was just like, <laughs> that's it. That's what I'm going to do. And, uh, and so I did my first magic performance for my preschool class. Oh, um, wow. I, yeah, crazy. In hindsight, looking back, I'm like, I see four year olds now and I'm like, whoa. <laughs> um, but, um, but at the time I didn't, of course, you're just like, oh, this is what I want to do. Um, and, uh, and then I, um, from there, um, did performances for school and my block parties and stuff like that. And then, um, I actually got paid to do a magic performance for the first time when I was six. Wow. Wow. Which also is <laughs> mind bending to me now as an adult. Um, but and tr truthfully, this is the only job I've ever had. Oh, that's um, perfect, though. So what, you. what was your first magic trick that you did? Do you remember? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I actually do. Um, and so, well, I guess it depends on how you define magic trick. The first, the first kind of stuff that I, like, attempted to perform was a lot of, like, 
hey, look, now you see it. Now you don't, you know, kind of stuff. And Four year old then, stuff. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> we're like, I thought I was being terribly innovative, but, um, but then um, that, that TV special that I saw that aired in October of that year. And so then, um, then I, uh, you know, thankfully Christmas was around the corner. So my parents got me a magic set for Christmas that year. And, um, and so it's very intuitive of them and supportive. Well, it is so supportive. I was going to say, <laughs> I will give my parents all the credit in the universe. I'm like intuitive, maybe not so much. Cause I was probably like 18 <laughs> hours a day, like magic, 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 magic. But, um, you know, in, in that magic kit, and this is really how I sort of define my first, uh, you know, magic trick, um, you know, magic sets truthfully have not changed much in the last, like, 150 years, um, which also is incredible to me. I mean, you can look at historic magic sets from like the mid to late 1800s and there's almost the identical stuff in them. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's pretty wild. Um, but, um, but the, the magic set that I got, um, was, uh, had in it a little thing, which is still in most magic sets today. Um, uh, it's often called a ball and vase. Um, and so it's like a little plastic stand, um, and you take a little cover off and there's a ball in it. Normally the balls are like, it's like a bright red, like little plastic thing. And you take the cap off and then you take the ball out and you like hide it somewhere and you put the lid back on. And then when you take the lid off again, the ball has reappeared. Mm. And it's really, it's actually the, even though it is, so because it's my first, the first piece of magic I really learned mm. and performed, I have, you know, it, it holds such a special place in my heart. But as an adult, um, and even into my teens and stuff, the, I really came to appreciate, um, like you're talking about, kind of the more of the science and psychology behind even literally like the simplest piece of magic that is often the first piece of magic that children, very young children learn, um, is actually this very complex combination of sort of really a beautiful feat of kind of object design and engineering. Mm. Um, and then also the perceptual sort of built in expectations about how we have sort of these built, um, learned um, ideas about the objects around us um, and, and how layered that is. So it's, it's really interesting to study. I'm curious. So Michelle and I are both scientists. We're both researchers. So we'd love to define our terms. What would be the definition you would give for magic? What would you, you know, how would you define that term? Oh my gosh, that's so <laughs> <Hard>. <laughs> um, I mean, for, for me, um, and I'm only speaking for myself here because this is actually a really kind of hotly contended or contested thing um, within, you know, kind of the magic field. But mm -hmm. for me, um, I'm just speaking totally on the fly here. Um, I mean, I feel like it, I, I feel like, you know, for me, a piece of magic is a performance of a learned skill um that is often you know supplemented not always but is supplemented by you know sleight of hand some form of you know dexterity related technical skill with a foundation of a lot of psychology that is based in again ideas of our human learned understandings of the physical laws of nature and then kind of creating these performed scenarios of kind of violating the laws of nature. Yeah. yeah. That's a great definition. <laughs> so, you know, you outside of your natural abilities as a four and six year old, um, <laughs> how does one become an illusionist? So you were talking about you know, different physical principles that you have to understand and different psychological and perceptual principles that you sort of play on. Right. Um, so how, how do you get to where you are? Yeah. Um, so for me, um, and I feel like this is a fairly, um, you know, traditional path in a very non-traditional way of doing things um, is, you know, one of the things I love about magic is I feel like it's one of few fields where things are really still primarily 
handed down from person to person mm -hmm. and in books. Um, you know, you can't, um, certainly within, you know, the United States, you know, you can't go and get a bachelor's degree in being a magician, <laughs> you know. Um, interestingly, now that- Are you implying that you can elsewhere? <laughs> well, well not, 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 not a bachelor's degree, but interestingly, I know, I, I have not fact-checked this recently, but at one point, somewhat recently, I know about 10 years ago, this was the case, you were able to get an associate's degree in magic in South oh, cool. Korea. Oh, wow. Um, I am not sure- if that program still exists. Mm -hmm. um, but I know that that was the one place. And then, and then there are a number of individual courses in academic institutions in America where you can take single courses on magic. Mm. So for example, um, uh, I have a friend and colleague, David Finkelstein. He's an amazing um, philosophy professor at the University of Chicago. Um, he was kind enough to actually let me audit his, uh, his class, um, which is uh, Magic, Wonder, and Skepticism. Oh, wow. So he takes a whole look at, um, at principles in you know, skepticism and philosophy and then how that interweaves with different aspects of performance magic and how magic can sort of act as an embodied um, performance approach um, to various ideas and skepticism. Um, and then there's um, Dr. Lawrence Haas. Um, he's, um, he's also a philosophy professor. Um, philosophy is kind of my hobby. Um, but mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Dr. Lawrence Haas um, has had several different um, magic and philosophy courses at universities across the U.S. Um, and, and, as, and then I'd be you know, remiss to not mention um, Dr. Anthony Barnhart, who's a psychology professor and researcher who teaches um, a psychology of magic course at Cambridge, uh, at Carthage College um, in Wisconsin. Um, mm -hmm. So there's different academic, um, you know, kind of approaches typically within a single course fashion that are looking mm -hmm. either at the psychology or the philosophy of magic and how we, um, you know, how, how students can have these takeaways from that in a more broader, you know, um, approach to their other studies. Um, so, um, I, I, thankfully, I've been lucky enough to like, you know, sit in <laughs> on all of these classes, um, but, um, or, or present at them, but, um, but they, um, but for me, you know, from, um, as, as a t tiny bit of backstory, people, of course, um, are always like, oh, your, your family must do this. This must be in your family, which it is not, um, my <laughs> My dad's background um, is in kinesiology and fitness management. Um, my mom is a freelance graphic designer. Um, so this was so out of the blue. Mm -hmm. And so they, you know, in the early, you know, mid 90s, really, um, pre-internet availability um, to the average person was, you know, we're like, what do we do? Um, <laughs> we, you know, like, what, what how, uh, you know? Um, and so we went to the library, um, tore through every book on magic that our library had. Wow. Um, yeah, my mom would, I mean, my my parents are totally amazing. Oh, um, yeah. We, my mom would read me the books. My dad would help me make the props in the books. Oh, wow. um, and, um, and then we, um, and then once we kind of exhausted that resource, then it was like, what next? Mm -hmm. And, um, and then my mom read an article about a local magician who incidentally, um, was actually the great nephew of one of the most prominent vaudeville magicians in America, Howard Thurston. Um, this was his, uh, his nephew, his name was Ralph Beck. Um, and she reached out to him and, you know, to see if he would teach me. And so kind of in lieu of, piano lessons or soccer or basketball <laughs> or something I did magic lessons wow um and my teacher was in his 80s when I started um or maybe it was in his late 70s but I started <laughs> taking lessons with him when I was five mm -hmm. and um and worked with him until he, he until he passed when I was about 12 That's um nice. which was a really beautiful thing so so basically that was that was kind of my learning path and then still to this day really that's still really how it is, is really primarily learning things from books and then working with individual mentors in the field. That Do you think there's uh, like different styles um, and how things may have changed from like vaudeville, oh, right? Absolutely. 
Because I do think that when I think about illusionists now, um, it does seem that there is a lot of tapping into science and psychology. You know, I do, I do think they talk about that a little bit more, maybe. I think there's, you know, some Netflix series that have some illusionists. My daughter loves watching. We love watching them as a family. I think one of them is uh, Magic for Humans, right? Um, it's really fun because they do talk a bit about that you know, the psychology and the, you know, just the, the workings of without giving away, like how the magic is done, obviously, but talking about why it, it kind of works. Um, do, do you see different styles? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, magic throughout history has always changed with mm-hmm. the times. Um, and, you know, we certainly are seeing that now. And we see the psychology of things change, you know, pretty, uh, pretty directly. Um, for me, I have had a long standing interest in historic pieces of magic mm. um, because the attention span that audiences had was very different. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I personally, I've been really, really fascinated. And a lot of my kind of technical background is in pieces of magic that are kind of from the Victorian era through oh, wow. um, early early 20th century. And the thing that I really love about those pieces of magic, and I could never quite, before I learned this, I couldn't quite pinpoint it. I was like, why? And I, I ended up asking a, a colleague of mine who's a magic historian. I was like, why are these, why do these pieces of magic like feel really elegant? Like, why do they mm. feel just kind of, um, kind of beautiful in a way that I can't articulate and really there's two reasons which one of which is just the time scales on them where Mm -hmm. when you have a piece of magic uh, and I don't do this because of contemporary society I'll come back in a minute but if you are taking 20 minutes to do Mm -hmm. one piece of magic Mm -hmm. the way that you are able to really in a very nuanced way construct a bed of psychology yeah. to underlie what you're building on top of that is so different mm-hmm. than when you're trying to do something in two minutes. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so, so you would sort of see, and then similarly in a narrative way. And so then I was like, why is it that these things just like feel really kind mm-hmm. of like rich, you know, mm-hmm. in a way. And then it was like, oh, because a lot of times they were taking more time um, to just be able to build more depth um, into just having a deeper psychology going on. Yeah. Um, and then similarly, the, um, the materiality of it, um, where in, you know, if you look at things, especially things that are like pre-industrial revolution, um, you know, I, I would, I love looking at, at magic from that era. Um, and in this same, same conversation with this historian, I was like, you know, this stuff is all just like, you know, not only sort of has this rich, beautiful psychology, but then it's also just the aesthetic on it is like, Mm. just really, really lovely. And, um, you know, kind of why is this? And it was like, oh, well, this was before, you know, mass manufacturing. (laughs) And so if you were going to have, you know, for example, like the, the, you know, the ball and vase that I mentioned, kids magic sets, those were in magic sets in that, in that time period difference mm-hmm. being now they're out of cast plastic as yeah. opposed to then they're out of turned wood mm. and so you'd see all these things where you're like oh here's something that's you know out of mahogany you know or something yeah, like, wow, yeah. oh you know this looks incredible yeah. you know? <laughs> and and you're seeing things that just like were these you know artisan made like really beautiful things that people were were using in their performances as opposed to then you know when you see these historic evolutions, like when we get into vaudeville, where then suddenly the constraints of the performance are, we got to do short performances, everything mm-hmm. has to get loaded onto train cars mm-hmm. and, you know, packed yeah. flat and like all this stuff. And, and, you know, so it's, so it's just things that change, change with the constraints. It's really time. interesting. I think yeah. that also applies to, you know, a lot of the marketing that people do as well. I mean, you have where people cool. used to watch television and were forced to watch, con- you know, commercials, right. Yep. And they were, you know, 60 second spots. And now it's come to, you know, the five, or six seconds they have before the next YouTube clip or, you know, just, you know, something that pops up for a few seconds on their app 
And so you really don't have a lot of time to engage people. And you've been doing, you know, especially with the um, pandemic that's been going on, you've made that shift into being more virtual. How, and that, that's, pretty amazing when you think that you're doing, you know, a sensory based illusion. Um, How do you make that transition? Yeah. I mean, I got very fortunate in that, you know, pre-pandemic, all my live performances were very interactive Mm -hmm. in a way that, um, that had kind of mass audience participation. Um, So I had a number of things that I did Um, where I would have one of the things I've always been really interested in doing is is kind of trying to reimagine the narrative of the role of the magician and Mm -hmm. you know kind of instead of you know we especially again you know kind of growing up in the 90s we saw you know magicians so much in the fore as being um, you know very like very you know kind of flashy very like you know, which is great. And it was like, drama. So, yeah, lots of drama, <laughs> like very, and, and again, like that's, that's why I got into magic, you know, yeah. it's very captivating. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I think for me, there's also a real interest given sort of my just personal interest in science and philosophy. There's also a real interest for me in saying, hey, how do I use this as my medium to provoke and foster dialogue with other people Mm -hmm. and so it's like well if I can just act basically as a facilitator to sort of stand along Mm -hmm. these demonstrations that's that's more interesting to me personally so because of that um, I had a lot of pieces in my live performances where audience members um, were really kind of in the driver's seat and really you know, um, making choices that guided the show were, you know, sometimes performing pieces of magic in their own hands with me just kind of guiding them. Mm -hmm. Um, So I had a lot like that, that once I kind of figured out, okay, here's how we maybe do this with just utilizing the chat instead of, you Mm -hmm. know, having everybody in a room, or here's how we maybe do this, you know, with just having, um, you know, video instructions of something or, you know, whatever, being able to just utilize the tech in a different way um you know i I felt fortunate in being able to sort of cross cross that that bridge i'm curious yeah with the switch over to virtual did you or even when you were in person do you feel like there is a certain sense that or sense that is easier to play with for illusions versus other sense and and why is that oh absolutely um so obviously you know vision is the number one thing that is simplest Mm -hmm. um because we are highly visual creatures um and and so much of magic is built i mean you know magic is primarily a visual form and it's built on um our visual assumptions and expectations and you know sort of defying that so um so that's the bulk of the bulk of magic and then um I got very interested in looking at other senses in magic as part of the first artist residency that I did, um, which was about six or seven years ago. Um, and then started thinking about, okay, what would, you know, what would a magic illusion with sound look like? What would a magic illusion with touch look like? You know, really mm-hmm. trying to kind of think about what that would be. And the one that I kept being drawn to um, was sent um, mm-hmm. partially because at the time I was doing a lot of archival research and um, I could find, I mean, I could basically count on one hand the number of times in like the main archive of written history on magic, um, primarily in, in the, you know, Western, Western magic, the, the times that people had done any magic using scent was like wow. all none. And so I was like, oh, well, like, <laughs> scent is so fascinating to me yeah Personally, I'm really interested in it as this sort of like invisible ephemeral mysterious you know kind of medium um and like why is nobody doing this and then I discovered very quickly why nobody was doing this because it's <laughs> almost impossible to work with um, and, but I I still you know I still I still love um playing with it I still you know I have pieces that I prefer several pieces um, that I created and perform with it. Um, but you know, the, it's a lot without getting 
too technical, you know, the, the, the ability to manipulate what somebody sees mm-hmm. is a lot simpler than manipulating <laughs> what they smell. But it's interesting, you know, because scent is so emotional yes. and so connected to memory. Yes. You know, there's the, the Proustian memory they always talk about with, uh, yeah, with the Madelines and, and how, it, you know, I think the line is, you know, dipping the Madeline in and feeling the crumble and smelling the, the smell and the tea, like gave the person shudders. And so there is such a connection people have uh, that it does just make sense that that should be something that you can, can manipulate. And for certain, it does work really well in products, you know, where we're um, you can sort of create a context Mm -hmm. based on fragrance, right? You know, you give people lavender and they're like, oh, it reminds me of my grandmother, you know, (laughs) stuff like that. So, you know, I I really look forward to when we can all be in person again, because I would love to see that kind of show. Um, That would be just amazing. Thank you. No, I'm looking forward to it too. And I um, I designed uh, an entire performance based on, um, based on these ideas of, you know, our sort of cultural and emotional understandings of scent um, called Bottling the Impossible, which I did um, in summer and fall of 2019. Um, and so I'm looking forward to, you know, being able to do those pieces, you know, in, in person in kind of a meaningful way again, which, you know, I've got, I, I've got some things um, on, on deck coming up soon. So, uh, <laughs> so I'll keep you all in, in the loop, um, but some, some per- short performances of some of those pieces will be happening in the New York City area in the near future. So. Oh, that's exciting. And um, you are virtual though. You do do some virtual performances. That's correct. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I've been, um, you know, throughout um, the last year and a half, um, I've been doing, you know, virtual performances for people all over the world, which has been such a joy. It's, it's kind of an advantage, right? It's so amazing. I mean, it's been, <laughs> it's been just fantastic to be able to, you know, help facilitate these experiences for people where, you know, I, I just this morning was doing, um, you know, a, a talk as a conference where, you know, that was UK based, but was global. Um, And so, you know, it's just really amazing to be able to connect with people that, you know, I think all of us have had this experience of being able to, to chat with people that we wouldn't have connected with otherwise, you know, case, case in point right now. Yeah, right. Exactly. And I do think what you were saying a bit about, you know, using scent and smells for magic, I think people have a bit more of an appreciation for your, you know, taste and smell just because of what everyone has gone through. And that's kind of come to the forefront of everyone's realization that it's such an important part of everyday life. Yes. Um, It also adds to your illusions. (laughs) (laughs) Well, yeah, because we don't, you know, interact with the world in a vacuum, right? We have all these sensory inputs. And again, that's what informs us of what we're supposed to believe and what we're supposed to do. (laughs) So I think it's, it's amazing how these worlds really make sense to come together. Yeah, no, I totally, I totally agree. And I think, you know, when we look at things in a larger contextual sense, you know, that's, what's, what's really interesting for me, you know, to be able to create. And like, for example, the Bottling the Impossible show, one of the things that I was interested in doing, you know, sort of in this both Proustian way and also in a just straight up kind of Pavlovian way, um, I was really interested in the idea of basically, can you, I mean, this in the gentlest, kindest way possible, can you kind of condition people um, to experience wonder Mm. through scent? So what I did as part of just an underlying thing in the performance was um, at timed at at specific intervals in the performance, um, I I had created a fragrance that then was um, just in a way that was not obvious to people was dispersed through the room Mm. that was timed basically when certain pieces of magic would happen. Um, And so then my hope um, was that people would sort of get conditioned to that. And then when people left the performance, everybody got little vials of that scent. 
so it was kind of a hope that then later people would be like, oh, you know, and then kind of be able to re-experience maybe that kind of split second of, you know, wonder, wonder or magic that they felt. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. A colleague of ours, um, Marcella, she actually bought a new perfume for her wedding mm -hmm. um, that they bring out just for special occasions, you yeah. know, like anniversaries and stuff like that, because it does remind them of that day. You know. Yeah. And I, I, when I first started working with scent, I met a woman and God, I wish I had like gotten her information. Um, but I met a woman in a fragrance store who had, who did a similar thing, but where she had, she had a specific scent that she bought, I think just in small quantities for every place she would travel to. Oh, wow. Oh, so, yeah. So then like, you know, for when she was like, oh, when I go to Colorado, I always wear this or when I, you mm -hmm. know, to Florida or when I go to Paris or whatever. And so she had just these like really, you know, visceral like reactions, mm -hmm. the scent and a place. And I just thought that was so beautiful. I love that. I love yeah. that. Yeah. There was a study that was done, I think, with Dunkin Donuts in Korea, where at bus stops, they did like this sort of test marketing campaign, sensory marketing campaign, where they filtered out the smell of coffee. Oh. And then they checked whether or not it increased sales to yeah. coffee oh. places located near. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can smell Dunkin' Donuts right now. And I'm like, hmm, I think I know what I'm doing after this is over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's pretty amazing stuff. And it's pretty cool, especially when you're talking about those associations. But but yeah, really thinking that something like Proust and something like Pavlov really, you know, play a role in these things is is very cool to hear. And I love the history aspect, you know, looking at your background, you've got this very Victorian look, you know, with the candles and the 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 wall with the ornateness to it. And it really does create a whole context that I think is quite lovely. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I think it is, it is really interesting just how, how we, you know, think about the world around us. And I think, I think it is so incredibly true that, you know, and this is, this is my big, my, my big reason why I do what I do is, you know, when we think about the complexity of the world around us it is just insane like absolutely insane like for me and again just coming at it you know really from just a science standpoint um that if i think about okay right now you know i'm sitting you know i'm in a multi-story building so it's like okay for me to be sitting on a chair in a building you know that there's you know that the way in which gravity is working with the building and the way the building has been engineered. And then I'm sitting in a chair. <laughs> so my body is exerting a force in opposition to gravity. And thank God, you know, my spine is strong enough, you know, to yeah. hold me to sit upright. Um, I'm speaking to you, you know, I'm having, you know, my vocal cords are producing a sound, like sound waves are incredible um, that is being perpetuated through this to have a you know, meaningful conversation that we understand through language that's going through technology, which I'm not even going to get into, you know, <laughs> so it's like all of the things, the infinite number of things that are happening in just like a nanosecond to make even just this, you know, simple conversation happen are really yeah. incredible. And so, you know, for me as a magician, as an artist, this is what I'm really interested in. It's like, we, you know, we don't often have the time um, to kind of go, whoa, it's Appreciate really amazing it. that yeah. I'm like sitting on a chair in a building. That's incredible. <laughs> you know, like that's really amazing, you know, and, um, and, you know, and I think magic is a fantastic medium, mm -hmm. you know, to, like I said before, have these conversations about really how amazing the world around us really is and how we how we have these sensory faculties to perceive and understand and build context for these things. Um, you know, magic does it in a way that's kind of an overdrive, you know, yeah. and looking at, okay, if you were, you know, doing, having some, you know, super crazy version of, you know, some scientific principle, what might that look like? Yeah. Um, but, but it's a cool way to then also shed light on, 
you know, here's almost some like sci-fi version of something, but reality is actually even more amazing. So, <laughs> you know, so I think it's a fun way to have those conversations. I love that. Yeah. I mean, maybe magic really focuses on it, you know, like yeah. brings it to light. Yeah. I love that idea. And yeah. there's an appreciation that you have for how, you know, everyday things. And you kind of helped in this conversation show us how intertwined magic and science truly are and, yeah. you know, how they kind of do have, you know, they, they work together in a way. Oh, totally. No, they totally work together. And, you know, one of my main brainstorming partners um, is Luciano Ristori. He's one of the, uh, he actually just retired as chief research officer of Fermilab, the National Particle Accelerator Laboratory based outside of Chicago. And so we have a lot of conversations about science and magic and, you know, where those things intersect. And they're so deeply intertwined and, yeah. um, you know, in, in just really beautiful, exciting ways. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Jeanette. And I really look forward to working together more in the future. I would love to find more ways to Yay. interact and, and continue the conversation. And um, yeah, so thank you so much. This was awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's been such a delight um, to collaborate with you all and uh, looking forward to more as well. Thank you so much for having me on today and for such an amazing, amazing conversation. <laughs> That's great. And could you let people know, uh, we will definitely post this with the, um, the interview, but we would love if you could share best ways to reach out to you. Yeah, absolutely. The best places to find me, um, are really sort of via Instagram. I'm at Jeanette Andrews magic. Um, and then on my website, which thankfully is JeanetteAndrews.com. <laughs> <laughs> that makes it easy. Yes. <laughs> Well, thank you again so much for joining us. And if the audience is interested in getting in touch with you, we'll be sure to pass along your information. If you want to hear more fun, curious conversations that we're going to be having all throughout season three, please like subscribe and comment below, do whatever you want and, uh, you know, enjoy the magic of the internet as well. <laughs> Love it. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Bye everybody. Thank you. Bye.